Okay, five, four, three, two, one. There we go. And welcome to the Kid Ministry Collective podcast. Our goal here on KMC is to encourage, equip, and entertain the kids' ministry community. My name is Tom Bump, and I'm the host here on the KMC podcast tonight. And I'm blessed to have Nick Blevins with me. Um, Nick is uh, a good friend. We've gotten to know each other online and through the Orange Conference. And and uh, uh, Nick's got a great website, um, and we'll talk more about that in a minute uh, of what his whole ministry is at. Well, I'll give him a moment to uh, share about what he's what he's doing. But uh, today our, on our episode, we're going to be talking uh, family ministry and some research that Nick has done. Um, we're also going to talk about uh, some fun comments by Andy Stanley that have gotten quite the buzz in small churches today. And uh, so it, it's going to be a great episode. So we're looking forward to this episode of the KMC. So, hey, Nick, thanks for, for joining me tonight. Uh, it's good to have you on. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Hey, Tom, thanks for having me on. Excellent. So tell us a little bit about yourself, your ministry, where you're at. Um, give the listeners a, a little bit of, of who Nick Blevins is. All right. I am in Baltimore, Maryland, just north. We're in a suburb there, but nobody knows where that is. So I always just say Baltimore, Maryland. And uh, my wife and I have been married for 10 years. We have two kids, Isaac and Mackenzie. And I'm at, on staff at Community Christian Church, and which I, I actually is 10 years old as well. So we got married. And then, uh, and I'd never really planned on and being on church staff, but one thing led to another and kind of jumped on board this team before we started the church. And we just celebrated 10 years a couple weeks ago, uh, which is a lot of fun. And I lead our children and student team. So birth through high school, the staff that kind of lead those areas. That's my role at the church. And do a couple other things with um, our efforts to help support church planners. Uh, but for the most part, it's in the family ministry world. So that's kind of me and what I do. Excellent. Excellent. Well, that's good because, you know, one of the things that a lot of uh, listeners on KMC are, are interested in, and, and whether it's a small church or a large church, uh, is thinking about family ministry and how do we minister um, and, and truly, well, let's start off with, give us a, your definition of what family ministry looks like, um, because there's all sorts of different ideas out there. But so to help our listeners, let's start with that. What, what's your definition of what family ministry looks like? That's a good question because there's a lot to it, I'm sure. But I think the core for me would be a family ministry is a church saying that we're going to serve families, help them you know, follow Jesus. And we're going to do that as one team. So from, you know, as we serve children from birth to students all the way through high school, even in the college, we're going to look at that as one because it is one life, right? That we serve one kid that grows up and gets older and moves from one phase to the next. And so I think family ministry is kind of recognizing that, looking at it as one picture, even though there are very distinct things about each age group and you, you know, approach that in different ways. And then on top of that too, um, I just I think this depends on your church size and the capacity and all that kind of stuff. But there's also that element of actually serving and helping families, not just with the events and the environments you create, but like how you equip parents. How do you partner with them? How do you help them grow? Um, and so that's kind of those. I think that's what family ministry is: is looking at that as one ministry and doing the best you, best job you can there, and then also serving the family and helping them where they are, you know, with the needs they have. Excellent. Um, now, you recently did a survey um, on your website, um, and uh, if people want to look at it, we'll have it in the show notes. Um, I have a link to it, um, but nickblevins.com. You did a survey uh, basically inquiring uh, about family ministry and, and uh, what different uh, roles people were in and that kind of thing. Um, well, give us an overview. Why did you do a survey like this, and then um, what were some of the things you learned from it? Yeah, Definitely. Um, so I feel like I blog to family ministry leaders, and that means, in my mind, what that means is children's ministry leaders, student ministry leaders, as well as people who lead a family ministry team uh, like I do, or even college ministry. And so I just, you know, I want my blog to be helpful. Uh, I don't want to write just to write. Um, it takes way too much work for that. <laughs> and so I love to do surveys here and there to figure out what do readers want, what do family ministries need, what um, what's working in their world, what's not working, what challenges are they facing. And so I called it the family ministry survey, but really what I wanted to hear from was both children's ministry leaders, student ministry leaders, 
and even family pastors, next gen pastors, whatever that title might be. Um, and so they kind of would indicate there's only 10 questions. They would indicate which role they were in. And then there was just some questions about what topics are they interested in? What challenges are they facing? Stuff like that. Okay. And so, um, as you, as you did the survey, um, what kind of jumped out at you? What, it, it, did anything surprise you about, um, you know, what you were inquiring about? Yeah, there were a couple surprises. Um, and I should say another reason I did the survey too, is not just to figure out like what challenges and all that stuff, but I've had two, two projects, I'll call it in my mind that I wanted to do, uh, to get going to help family ministry leaders. And the survey kind of helped me figure out like, is this really a need? Um, will this help them? That kind of thing. And I think it did that, and I don't think it was much of a surprise. But I would say a couple of surprises were, one, it was really hard for me to get student ministry leaders to fill it out, um, like really hard. At one point, there were probably 200 responses, mm -hmm. 150 or 60 of which were children's ministry people, 30 or so that were family, family pastors, and 10 student pastors. And so that was um, a surprising a little bit. Now, part of it wasn't surprising because I know – my uh, audience on the blog is way more geared towards children's ministers and family pastors. So that part wasn't surprising, but still to have just 10, because I didn't just post it. It wasn't just people that, you know, already follow my blog or just saw it on Twitter or something. I even was able to put it in a couple of Facebook groups, even one for student pastors. And so that was pretty surprising. I, I actually um, had, had to make some shifts and do some things to actually get more student pastor input to get that up over 50 which was good because otherwise it wouldn't have been helpful. So that was surprising. Um, the other thing that was surprising but was, was good was one of the questions was what topics are you most interested in? Rank them, kind of rate them from, you know, I'm most interested in this one to I'm least interested in this one. Mm -hmm. And there were a whole list there. Um, but two of them were volunteer training, volunteer recruiting, which you would guess would be the most mm -hmm. popular. That's, that was right. my guess. Um, and then there was partnering with parents, small group, like small group for kids, small group for students, um, productivity, team building, like things like that. And I was surprised that number one and number two were partnering with parents and small groups for kids and students. So that was, that was good. So I thought that's great. Yeah, that's real good. Yeah. Hopefully that means one, you know, family ministry leaders are thinking about those things that I think are really important. And two, uh, maybe they're not dying for, for need of volunteers to the point where they can actually focus on these things. Now, volunteers did come up later. Uh, there's a question about, like, what challenges you're facing. And the way it was phrased was not enough time, not enough budget, not enough sleep, you know, whatever it might be. And um, not enough volunteers was number one there by a wide margin. So it's still a need. But I was ple pleasantly surprised to see the emphasis on small groups and partnering with parents. Yeah. So – it, from your experience, then, when it comes to to um, family ministry and partnering with parents, what do you see? Um, do you see any trends as far as what people are doing, what's working out there? Yeah, that's a good question. I feel like the whole thing is very new. So even though I remember five years ago at the Orange Conference, there was a great breakout about like some ideas to partner with parents. And um, even then and now, it feels like it's uh, experimenting, like we're all just trying things. Um, I think one of the things that I have leaned towards that we're trying to do more of, and I've seen other churches do as well, is partner with parents without adding a whole lot more to your calendar. Because it's already, you know, we're already busy. And so just taking advantage with the way we communicate and making sure parents are on the same page, um, taking advantage of the times when kids or students are transitioning from one age group to the next. I don't know about everybody else, but for us, parents really lean in there. And so it's easier to connect with them and, you know, equip them and serve them and, and that kind of stuff. So um, even our, uh, as an example, our student ministry, we've been having a, we call it coffee talk. All it is is 45 minutes before we have our student environment on Sunday nights. Parents are invited. Uh, they talk with their student small group leaders and we give them something helpful to use as a parent of a student. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's an example of like, it wasn't a whole separate thing. And so it's actually a lot easier to, to do you know, than a whole separate event or something like that. So I think that's been helpful. And then I feel like I'm seeing a lot of churches lean in more to uh, equipping parents, um, serving marriages, helping families that way, and a cooperation between family ministry 
and maybe groups or discipleship or whatever part of the church that has usually done classes for parents, classes for marriage, stuff like that. I feel like I'm seeing churches work together more there, and I think that's helpful. Yeah. So um, I'm curious, what, what uh, how long did it take you guys to really, I mean, are you getting good attendance on on, on that, uh, the parent, the coffee time or? We were, uh, the last one was not as good. And it could be just a blip. You know, the first one was great. The second two, I think this was the fourth one. So the second and third one were pretty good. And then this last one wasn't. And we just had to figure out, we'll do another one. You know, we, do, we try to do like three each school year. So we have another one planned and we'll see. You know, we'll see if that, if that one is as good or if there is some kind of tail off there if momentum's being lost. I know one thing we try to do is, I don't think most, especially for, we have a lot of parents who already know their student small group leaders. You know, they might have the same small group. There might be three or four years now. And so the connected parents that are really part of our church, it's not always enough of a draw to say, hey, come talk with your student small group leader because, hey, you do that every Sunday morning. And you know what I mean? So we've tried to add in this piece. We've had it from the beginning, but we try to talk about it better. Of Hey, here's something helpful we're going to give to you. Um, you know, I was like the last time we did it, we talked about apps that parents should be aware of that students use. And to me, that was a great hook, you know, because parents definitely haven't felt need there, um, but, you know, wasn't as good as we'd hoped. We still had a good number of parents, but it was definitely down from previous coffee talks. Yeah. Now, do you guys do anything for your elementary environment to connect parents in a similar way, or, or what do you do? Yeah, we did our first ever um, parent and small group leader lunch, and we used the kit from Kenny and L. Campbell. If you go to stuffyoucanuse.org, their site, you can buy that. We bought that, and that they had led in middle school ministry, and that's what it was designed for, but it works in any age group. And so that was the first place we did it. It was with elementary. Um, we had a lunch, brought in small group leaders and parents, and they sat at their table and talked. And then, you know, if they had kid, multiple kids in the environment, they'd move around. Um, we've not done that every year, though. That is a big one. You know, that's a lot bigger to pull off than a coffee talk. That's where it'd be great if we had the space or the time to do the same thing in elementary world, but we don't because it's Sunday morning, it's services back to back, three mm -hmm. services, all that kind of stuff. Um, the best we found other than that is, is those transition events. So when we're bringing in kindergartners, when kids are moving up and we're communicating, we try to use those times um, to talk with them, serve them, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So that sounds awesome. I mean, you definitely have got, you know, you guys have thought through how to connect church and parents and, and that's, that's really cool. What are some other things that, that maybe you've heard of or that you guys are doing that you could suggest that people, you know, maybe give a try um, to get parents and, and church connected? Well, I think the, I think the coffee talk is a really easy idea. You know, you just, you just have coffee and some desserts and invite them 30 minutes before. If your student ministry happens during a service, that's a different challenge, you know. But if you had the space, you know, if we had another space near our elementary environment, for instance, on Sunday morning, we would do it there. Mm -hmm. um, that's available. But we don't. We use all of our available space for services. So I, I think that's big. Um, I would say, though, I feel like some of it you have to approach based on the size of your church. I don't think it's hard enough to run the environments that most churches run for kids and for students that until you get to a certain size and have a certain amount of resources and staff, I don't think the answer is have four parenting classes a year, do three transition events, you know, have a small group that you're part. I think you really have to like narrow it down and just do one thing really well, whatever that might be. Um, we've done parenting events where we bring in a guest speaker they have a topic. We've done the book, Parenting Beyond Your Capacity, and brought in guest speakers to kind of present that, which has been really good. But that's on the, you know, certainly on the bigger side in terms of the work. I think one of the biggest things we can do, and we can do this better at our church, we're talking about that now, is get small group leaders and parents connected just in terms of communication. So how can we equip our small group leaders with a list of their students, their kids, and their parents, and the contact information, and give them, hey, here's a eight-sentence template email to send to your, the parent of your student. You're going to put your name in there and their kid's name, and you're going to say something specific about that kid or that student to open the door to conversation. I mean, I think that's a great start. And we've learned that to administer that on the back end, like if you're going to do it regularly, you know, it takes some work. It really does. It takes some work there. But to do it one time, just to kind of get their relationship started, I think is pretty easy. So I think that's something that churches could try. I think that's really helpful. 
That's cool. Yeah, I think, you know, um, I, I know a lot of people do struggle with that, um, you know, of what can they do? And and sometimes they'll hear, you know, I know, you know, I've served in some smaller churches and, and a lot of people that listen to KMC do come from those churches that are 500 300 200 <laughs> um and and so they struggle and and so i think you hit a great point pick one thing and do it well um mm -hmm. and i i guess from my experience i'd echo that i would say yeah yeah you know you don't have to you know find an idea from a bigger church um and that that worked well and modify it make it your own but just do that one thing um or or find something that's close to that and uh and, and do it. Yeah. Like you said, not everybody could do an environment. I, uh, yeah. In my church, I couldn't pull off a, a Sunday morning. I don't have the space either for, to do something for elementary parents, but I could possibly do that on a different day or time, um, offer some child care on the side, um, and, or, you know, some kind of programming for the kids while we talk with the parents. And, and I think we would get some parents like that. So it's a good idea. I'm going to try that. Child care and food, you might get a lot of parents. You know, if you can get those. Yeah. Yep. Well, another, yeah, another idea, we don't do this, but I, uh, somebody else I was talking to recently kind of pitched this out there. I thought it was a good idea, too. You could even start a Facebook group for the parents in your church. you got to yeah. figure out how to keep inviting new parents to it, and then you got to monitor it well. You don't want it to become like some crazy, I don't know, complaining zone or whatever. You know, about right. how, cause parenting's hard, and there's a lot you can, you can complain about. But that could be a chance if you're in there and some other people from your team are in there to – really share things every week or hear what they're wrestling with. Like that's one that you could probably pull off a lot easier than some other things. Yeah. Um, and you had mentioned, and, and in fact, I saw it on your blog. Uh, um, and this wasn't really in our show notes, but I'm going to throw it in there. Hopefully you don't All mind. Right. Cause you mentioned about apps. Um, and, and I know you're, you're fairly techie on this kind of stuff. What you, you did. And, and I'll encourage our listeners again, go to, go to Nick's blog and, and he's got a whole article um, that you can get um, about different apps that you guys use in family ministry. Could you share just a couple of those um, that you think, you know, you found the most beneficial? Yeah, sure. Um, I find myself asking that a lot of other church leaders. So that's why I put that together. Cause like, I want to know what tools they're using, what resources they're using, you know, how are they, you know, doing family ministry, making it easier. Um, we use Google everything. So I'm like, I could, you could run down the whole list of Gmail, Google Calendar, Google Drive, the Docs, mostly because it's easy to collaborate. It's in the cloud. You know, we don't, we pretty much don't do anything in spreadsheets or Word documents offline anymore or out of the cloud just because it's so easy to share. Plus, if somebody were to leave, I don't know, step out of the role or something, is it all like on their computer and then it's kind of lost? You know, we're trying to get that more. Uh, where we can all use it and kind of collaborate on it. Uh, we love Basecamp for project management. It's really like um, an organized, glorified to-do list uh, or multiple to-do lists, you know. So we just, for instance, we just had a big children's event, um, and we used Basecamp, had multiple to-do lists. You can assign, you know, to-dos to different people and put notes and all that kind of stuff. And my favorite thing about Basecamp actually is that you can, you know, do the whole project finish it, you know, complete all your to-dos, everything that's in there, put in notes, discussion, whatever you use it for. And then you can save that as a template. And if you do that event or that trip or, or whatever next year, you just bring that template up, you know, start a new one and you have everything you did last year right there, ready to go. So that's one that we really like. Um, I would say our student ministry uses uh, word swag, just a simple app on I iPhone or tablet. I um, iPad where you can just create graphics that look good and it's really simple. So I think that's helpful for churches because it's not like all of us have, you know, we don't have like graphics people that necessarily right. staff. Everybody doesn't have that. And even if you do, that can take a long time or whatever. Whereas with Word Swag, you can create stuff in there that's pretty good and you can use right away. Um, so that's another one that we use that I think is really helpful. I could probably think of some more there if, if you want to talk about some more, but I think those are the ones that come to mind when I think about ones that have been the most helpful uh, and we use the lead small app for our small group leaders. That's been awesome. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Well, that's good. I mean, I just want to give the listeners a taste of, of some of those things and that, like I said, they can go onto your blog and, and, and what I think there was like 30 of them or something that you. Yeah. Got. I put 30 in there, which is a pretty, I mean, pretty exhaustive. There's not many more that we use than what I put in there. And um, you know, most of them are free. Very few of them are ones you have to pay for, so that's really cool. 
And I'd love to hear what other people use too. So if you go there and you check it out, comment or something like, here, yeah. I use this and, you know, that'd be helpful. Yeah. Um, you know, I'll have to start a, uh, maybe I'll put a question up on our, our um, Kid Mystery Collective Facebook group and, and uh, I'll link that article as well. And, and maybe we'll see, see if anybody else, yeah. um, what, what else, what other lists we come up with or whether apps, uh, um, we hit on. So I'm always, I'm always looking for new stuff. Um, so <laughs> yeah. I'm not necessarily like, I think I even say that in the resource, but I'm not like on the cutting edge of it. You know what I mean? I don't always know the newest thing. I'm more just interested in what's working well, what can help make things easier or routine. You know what I mean? That's what I'm looking yeah. for. And yeah. all the ones we use there, I wouldn't say, I don't know if any of them are new, you know, a lot of people would have heard a lot of them, but they're really helpful. Cool. Well, one of the things that I know you do is you, you're, you've really developed a, a consulting church ministry to help other churches and you, you know, you've done some help with church plants and stuff like that. And, um, recently, um, Andy Stanley made some comments, um, that created quite the buzz, um, you know, around the blogs and around Twitter and, and all that kind of thing. Um, and, uh, um, there was a couple different articles. I even got sent one from, from even a parent at church um, asking my thoughts about it. And, and uh, I found it interesting. And so I thought this would be fun just to, to chat about. I like to, we try to come up with every, every once in a while some hot topics on the KMC. So we thought this would be a good one um, uh, to talk about because like I said, I know you've worked with a variety of different size churches too. And, and so have I. So um, basically, um, the, the criticism he got, and, and you, I think you've heard it too, so you can clarify too. Um, but my my take on it was is that you know he basically made a comment about smaller churches, people who uh, attend smaller churches, they, they could be considered selfish um, with keeping their children in those smaller churches rather than going to larger churches. Um, more or less, um, in fact, one of the the article I read here, this is this is their quote of it is. Um, um, let me read this. Forgive me for reading it, but this is what they said. Um, according to Stanley, big churches are better equipped uh, to disciple the next generation because they're big enough to segregate, segregate people by age and then design programs to suit specific age groups. Um, and so we want churches to be large enough so that there's, there's enough middle schoolers and high schoolers that we don't have to have one youth group with middle school and high school together. He said, we we want there to be so many adults that there will be so many middle school and high school kids that we can have two separate environments. Um, what, what kind of, what was your take on it when you first heard this? Uh, I'm just real curious to see what another family ministry person besides myself, uh, what was your first thoughts? Yeah. Well, actually I, I kind of like waded into it unknowingly. Actually, I have a friend of mine who's a, one of our, uh, he's a pastor of one of the churches that we help plant. And, um, I should say at the very beginning that I'm, I'm definitely biased. I've been heavily influenced by Andy Stanley. In fact, a big reason I work for a church now is because of Andy and his ministry and his books and stuff like that. So, um, but I heard I, some, one of my friends tweeted uh, a piece from his talk that I didn't know that the time came from that. It just said, parents, don't make your, ch your children go to a church that makes them hate church. And I retweeted it and said, Amen. Now, little did I know this was coming from like a very controversial message. <laughs> I'm thinking, I agree with that. I don't want my kids to hate church, you know. And yeah. I know what it means. Even by alone, I could just I could point to experiences like that for sure. And um, but anyway, I had no idea that was happening. And then my wife actually gets an email from someone we know who thought, Does Nick does Nick agree that small churches are selfish? And they like they had a quote in there as if it was from Andy's message. And I'm like, Okay, I know Andy pretty well. I can understand why he would say some of those things. Like some of it didn't surprise me. I know how their strategy for student ministry, how, what size church they like. I mean, all that stuff. But that quote itself, I thought that doesn't sound right. And what it said was small churches are selfish. That's what it said. Or people that like small churches are selfish. Yeah. But of course I had to go and watch it. I'm like, I got to see this thing. And there was a post up at the time. This was early. I guess it was like Friday the week of. So when I searched for it, there wasn't a lot, you know, it wasn't that widespread yet. It was, uh, there was two articles. Literally, somebody's blog and Christianity Today. And so I've read on there. That guy had the same quote in there. So I watched the video, and I never found that exact quote. I even tweeted that guy and said, can you help me find this? You know, because, like, 
you know, maybe I'm missing it. Maybe it came back up yeah. 15 minutes later. And I should have watched the whole message, but I didn't. I watched just that part, you know what I mean? And he tweeted me back and actually said, that was his mistake. That's not actually what Andy said. Somebody else said that, and then he quoted it, and that's what uh -oh. happens. That's what happens in the yep. internet world. Yeah, um, it is, isn't it? Yeah. We're, I mean, we're almost too fast on the gun. You know, we jump on it. It's just like any news event. Usually the first reports you hear are totally wrong from the facts. Yeah, or and I probably more common is a case like this where, like, some of it's true. Yeah. It's just worded a little bit differently, and it changes the whole meaning. Like the two, right. I, even now, I bet you if you search, the two big headlines are uh, Andy Stanley thinks small churches are selfish, and Andy Stanley thinks people who attend small churches are selfish, right? Right. But when he, what he said was in the beginning, he described, to me, he described a person. And there are things he said that I don't agree with, and we could talk, we'll get to that too. But in the, in the beginning, he described a person. He talked about someone who, and there was a list of a few things that described them. One, they don't like large churches. You know, they're anti-large churches. Two, they attend small church. And three, they attend a small church because they can know everyone. And he said they're selfish. That's who he labeled selfish. And for me, I am I know those people. You know what I mean? I would agree, actually. Those people who the reason they attend church is for their own benefit, I think, is selfish. But we all know you can a lot of people do that in large churches, don't they? They attend a large church because what it can do for them, what it can do for their kids. So that's where I feel like Andy definitely, you know, missed it because it made it sound like, I don't know, only people that, the only people that do that attend small churches. That's not true. People do that and attend large churches. In fact, that's probably one of the bigger problems that large churches have to face is that consumeristic, you know, mindset. Um, and then as he went on and talked about student ministry and the size, there are pieces to that. I think any of us that have led at any children's ministry or student ministry but student ministry in particular, there is something to critical mass or just this feeling that when I get there and I show up, especially if I'm new, um, it could be awkward if there's 10 of us and say I'm new and nine of them know each other. They've known each other forever. Their families have attended the church forever. Uh, we experienced this. Our church is not a small church. We're not a mega church either, but we had a couple of our ninth grade girls, actually the twin daughters of our preschool director, awesome girls. They are not selfish. And they did not like their small group because it just so happened their small group was like really small. It was three or four. They were two of the three or four. They attended every week and the third or fourth girl didn't. And so sometimes it was just that those two and the two leaders, those two, one other girl and two leaders. And so that's an example where I can see the truth in what Andy's saying that sometimes if you can have more students and a larger Mm -hmm. environment it's easier for people to feel comfortable but where i think it misses is there are plenty of small churches who do it well it's just the strategy is different what you do is if you're if your ministry is 15 students 20 students 12 students whatever eight students you kind of treat it i would like it's a small group how would you welcome somebody coming to your small group right. well you think about them you you know first day you're getting to know them they're getting to know everybody else and you, you kind of create the environment that way and that's what that's what churches do so the strategy changes, you know, because you can't do that with 300 students. It'd take forever, you know, if you're trying to get to know everyone as soon as you show up. So that's where I feel like uh, that was missed, and I'm sure he would probably agree with that. And uh, I know, I mean, I saw, I read his kind of interview where he backtracked a little bit on some of that stuff. But I think I do think the size thing matters. Like I think it's a, um, but I don't think it's a right and wrong. It's not small is bad, large is good, large is bad. So that's where I would disagree with anyone. I don't think right. you label a church good or bad based on size. Um, there's a great, I don't know if you've read it, but there's a great article from Tim Keller on church size and culture. Yeah, uh, if you Google it, I bet you could find it. It is excellent. I mean, it's excellent. He, it's not about like children's ministry or student ministry. It's about church overall. But he talks about, uh, he makes one of the statements that like a Baptist church of 400 and a and a Baptist church of let's say 2000 are very different so much so that they're more different than that Baptist church of 400 and the Methodist church of 400 or the Baptist church of 400. You know what I mean? Where two churches that are different denominations, but are close to the same size are probably more alike than two di completely different size in the same denomination. And so he has like, That's interesting. Yeah. He has like, you know, it's a small church community is usually better because people can know everybody and you can do that more richly. Obviously, in a larger church, you can usually provide more ministries and, and meet more needs. So that's a good thing. But you lose some of that ability for people to have community right away. 
I mean, so, and the way I see it is there's strengths and weaknesses with both and you just got to be careful, you know, to, to lead your church. Well, whatever size it is. Yep. I think you nailed it right there. Um, and, and I, that's where, yeah, I, I think I, I think the, the, the difference maker is the strategy. It's, it's knowing who you are, being comfortable with who you are, um, where, you know, I think, I think it's interesting. Sometimes the larger church is trying to become smaller mm -hmm. and, oh, yeah, for sure. you know, and, and then you have the smaller churches trying to be larger instead of saying, this is who we are. Um, and I mean, I get what the, the larger churches are saying. I, I've been in some bigger churches too. And, but yeah, I mean, there's different dynamics and I do, I think I'll have to look up that color because that, I think that's from my experience, that's very true. Yeah. Um, you know, I've hung out with, I've been in different denominations, um, that, that, yeah, I've been in, you know, I've been a small church guy, you know, 300 people <laughs> and, and hanging out with guys that got eight, 900,000, 2000 people. And we don't relate. Yeah. Um, in fact, they don't even want to hang out with me. <laughs> yeah, I'm just a small church guy. Well, I'm saying that would be a good example of, well, that's not right. Because yeah. that's an assumption that I can't learn. That's not true. The two are, and now I do think there is something helpful that you, primarily you should learn from churches near where you are, or maybe, maybe even a little bit ahead in terms of wisdom and history and size, mm -hmm. because you can relate more. But if that's all you do, you're missing it. I mean, you're totally missing it. Like, you know, the church of 5,000 should learn from the guy that just started and he has 100, or the church has been around for 300 years and, and runs 80. Like, we can all learn from everyone, and, and that would be a good posture to have, you know? Yeah. Most definitely. If we're gonna if we're gonna reach families today, we really do have to learn from each other, um, and and work together. Um, and I I do see that. And, and you know you you're connected a little bit more. I used to be more connected with the youth ministry side. I'm not so much anymore. But that one thing I will say, you know, I think the strength and this is what makes the Kid Ministry Collective so cool to me is that the Kid Ministry community over the last five to ten years, at least I've seen. Um, has really come together and, and worked hard to resource each other, to swap ideas. Do you see that in the student ministry side of things? Not as much, though. It's, a, it's happening a little more, and I feel like it's happening a little more through the digital world than locally. You know, so I, I lead a local children's ministry network, and um, it's probably been eight or nine years that we've been going. And so we have a mix of some people who have been there since day one, you know, like myself and others. We've been here the whole time which is really cool. And then every time we meet, there's new, you know, new folks, new churches. There's plenty of turnover too. But um, I remember when we hired our student pastor, he was fresh out of college. This was, you know, like nine years ago. And um, it, it didn't take three years before he was the most tenured student person in the area. And, wow. I, and that's, I think that's changing, but there was just that reality that the turnover in student ministry is really high. I think the average is like 18 months to 24 months. Um, and who knows if that's right, but my personal experience has been it is pretty high. Whereas in the children's world, this is not true for all of us, but most of them are what I would call homegrown. You know, they're not moving to so-and-so state to get a job in children's ministry because they had one or because they were trained in college. We're still on the, like, the, the early end where now you're seeing that a lot more in colleges and seminaries and stuff like that. But we're still in the early end where most of them are people in the church who, hey, we need somebody to lead this. Right. It would be, oh, they would be good. They're a great volunteer and they grow and, and, and they're not going to move. You know what I mean? And so that I feel like that has made it easier to connect. I will, I could get in trouble for saying this, but I do find um, in children's ministry world, generally speaking, they're more open to learn from each other. In student ministry world, it seems like it's more about uh, relationships and connection. So it's not a good and bad, but when you get them right. together, they, there's different things that they're looking for, you know, like, so when I get together, it's funny. We just had one of the children's ministry networks. We went to a church and learned from them. And I was kind of smiling because I know our, our network. I know how they think and act, what questions they ask, like, you know, and I didn't really give this church a heads up that, Hey, you're only going to give like 5% inspiration and vision. You want like 95% practical application. You know what <laughs> I mean? So they're like, they're talking about how they do children's worship and, and different things. And, and uh, and as soon, as soon as they ask for questions, man, it's real specific. So, like, how many do you – do you have a forum for – you know what I mean? Like, that's what it gets down to. And my experience is that's children's ministry world. We, they want to learn from each other. They want to, you know, figure out what practices you're doing. Student ministry, 
by nature, I think is more contextual. It is not as easy to plug and play. Oh, you do that. Let me, I think you get in real trouble there. Yeah. So that's why I think student pastors are smart and they know that. And so when they get together, they're more interested in connecting relationally, share some stuff here and there, but be challenged just that way. Um, and then the turnover though is what I've seen makes it hard for it to stick. But now with Facebook groups and things like that and different conferences, they've all, you know, there have always been conferences in student world, just like in children's world. So that's been really good. Yeah. Yeah. You know, well, good. That then it hasn't changed a lot because I know I, I spent probably the good first half of my ministry doing youth and children, but probably more heavily on the youth side. And, and we had some, um, some good networks um, back in, when I lived in Michigan, um, I know we, ha I had a great network of guys that would get together for prayer and we'd get together once a month for lunch and we'd pray, we'd talk, vent, um, yeah. um, you know, and, and yeah, there wasn't so much of, of talking strategy or resources. And I mean, that kind of thing. Yeah. It, it was a different relationship, um, yeah. than, than in the kid ministry world. So. Yeah, and it, and they'll definitely want to work together though. So it's not even an absence yeah. of wanting to work together. It's just the needs are different. Things don't apply as universally. Like we do a fall retreat for our students every fall, where we work with six other churches or so, and we're always looking to add more. And that's great. I mean, it's awesome collaboration. A lot of them have been there. You know, that helps too. A lot of those student pastors have been there for a while, like over five years. And so you know, we're kind of spread out all over the state, but we come together for that, which is really cool. Yeah. Um. Well, this one article, we're going to dive back in a little bit. Um, there was a, a, a blog, uh, her name's Julie Roy's. Um, I'm not sure if I'm saying her name exactly right. But she um, had a friend, her name's Tandy Thomas, and I, I guess you actually know Tandy. I do. Um, she's in her children's ministry network, so that was funny when you sent me that article. I'm like, yeah. I'm this person. Um, the, if you read the article there, the, the, the whole section on, on the research, I, she pointed to some research about family ministry and about the importance of, of getting parents involved. So I want to bounce back. We'll circle back to this as we get close to the end here. Um, I found it really interesting that the research that she quoted about the Fuller Institute, uh, Fuller Youth Institute study, and then the national study of youth and religion both of those studies, um, it really struck me, especially as a kids pastor and as a former youth pastor, um, and really kind of, you know, my heart is a family pastor. Um, I, I try to work as close as I can with our, our youth pastor as well here. Um, one of the things I saw was, you know, there's a couple different things. It was talking about the, the link of, of uh, an all church worship where the youth are involved in the worship and, and that kind of thing as well as um, the study about um, youth heading off to college and taking their faith away from home. Um, and there was a really interesting fact there that said 82% of children raised by parents um, who talked about faith at home attached more importance or greater importance to their beliefs as, as they moved on. Um, as you see family ministry today, um, that's a critical thing of of seeing that i kind of wondered i mean 82 percent raised by do that you know see that but how many parents do you feel like are really taking it home each week good question i think it's probably lower than i, mean, I know it's lower than we'd like and it's probably i don't know if i had to guess um probably like a third to a half is probably what i'd say and that's of people who are like really like for real involved in church, not I attend once every eight weeks or twice a year or something like that. Um, I mean, I think it's there, I guess what, I mean, I just know as a parent myself, it's easy to let anything, but even spiritual matters get pushed out. So I feel like what happens is there's some measure of it, but it's probably hit and miss. It's probably not as uh, woven into their weekly and daily life as they would like. I don't think the answer is it's perfect. We have this thing we run every day. I think that's mostly unrealistic for families, but to have that weekly and to have it with some key times and some rhythms, rhythms and things like that, I think is really good. But I don't know. It'd be interesting to find out. That's generally true of Christian practice in general. I mean, you know, across the board, much less leading your kids that there are a lot of people who it's hard for them to like, if you've ever seen the studies about how, how often people read their Bible, mm -hmm. that's an example of how it's so rare, which would lead me to believe it's probably also rare 
in terms of them transferring that faith to their children. Yeah. Um, you know, so from your perspective, then what, what do you think, um, as leaders, what can we do more of to increase that awareness of just how important it is for parents to connect um, and for the church to connect together, to really, truly partner together? I think some of it is awareness. I think most parents, well, especially if you were not part of a church, maybe, you know, you started getting involved when your kids were born, you weren't raised in church. Um, church can almost be viewed like school or sports where I'm not the expert. So I take my kids to the expert and then they take care of it. They teach my kids, they show, they show them how to play football or baseball or they teach them how to dance or play piano. Um, church can be treated the same way, you know, so that that's where we have to kind of teach and make sure they understand, no, that's not how it works here. It's not about putting an expert in front of your kids. It's about a relationship. It's about your kids watching you live it out. It's about other people in their life saying the same things you're saying to reinforce what you've lived out. That's what's really going to hit home. So I think Sticky Faith, I mean, that's a great book to get in front of parents. Like, what if you did an event where you just talked about a couple of the principles and then made it available to buy? Things like that, I, th I think, are huge. Like, we try to talk about, um, for instance, the book Parenting Beyond Your Capacity. At all, uh, a lot of our uh, events where their kids are transitioning from one age group to another, we'll break out that book and read those three statements. No one has more potential to influence your child than you. And we talk about that. Like, parent, hey, if you don't even know if you believe in God yet, God still wants you to be a leader in the, your, the life of your children. We're just going to come alongside you and help you as you do that, as you grow together. Or if you've been following God for 30 years, God wants you to step into that role. But you can't do it alone. So we kind of remind parents of that. I think that's part of it is. Um, I know as a parent myself, it's way easier to do things. This is true of anything in life, but it's way easier to do things that I can check it off a list that I know it's done. Right? I can't check off a list that my son has learned more about God today. You know, there are signs, there are stories, um, but, and I can't check off a list that my son has grown in his faith today or this week or even last month. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. There are things sometimes you can point to. Now, my kids are younger, but even as they get older, that's hard. And we just have a tendency to not put our effort into the things we can't like hold on to. Instead, we'll do that load of laundry, send that email you know, play that game, whatever it might be, just something that's more tangible. Um, and we're just so busy. So that's why I think it's hard. So the more we can do to help parents recognize the importance of it, I think really, really helps so they can use the time they do have. That's great. Um, all right. My last question is a, is a question I like to ask children's ministry leaders as I get around. Um, what's, what's one or two things that excites you the most as you look ahead um, in, in what God's doing in the kid ministry community, in the church world, what, what's, what, what excites you the most? Uh, definitely the collaboration. You alluded to that a little bit with student ministry. That's happening all over. Uh, like our network is awesome. I see new churches getting started in a way that wasn't true before, and that also relates to children's ministry. So children's ministries are, like a lot of times now, if you start a church, if a church planner wants to start a new church, it's, they, it's themselves, a worship leader, and a children's pastor. Like that's really cool. They're recognizing that the service of adults is really important and for students, and then leading kids is really important, and they're hired for that early. And then the collaboration, just working together, sharing resources, going to conferences and learning from each other. Um, I think that's really, really helpful. And then the other trend I would say that, I am excited about is I feel like the leadership in children's ministry is growing. So, you know, I don't know, 10 or 20 years ago, you may have thought children's ministry, you may not even use that term for one, you may have said Sunday school or something, you know. Um, but even if you did, you probably pictured someone who was great with kids, you know, get on stage, be funny, teach them, whatever it might be, lead them to sing. Like you, you pictured what I would say is a volunteer, and the trend has been that less and less children's pastors are that, and more of them are leaders. And you kind of need to be. I mean, anybody that's been in children's world knows you can't be in seven rooms at the same time. So it's, you know, at some level, you're forced to lead. But I think for a long time, just the nature of the ministry, the lack, I think a lot of children's pastors have been on an island, you know, quite honestly. 
Mm -hmm. Either they're not really supported at all from their church. It could even be antagonistic, not in a really negative sense, but they're not resourced. They're not prioritized. It's not talked about positively, you know, throughout the rest of the church. And all of that, I feel like, has trended in a much better direction. So I'm excited for, like, where it's going to go, even family ministry and bringing that all together. I'm excited about that. So I think the future is bright. Cool. I like that. I like that. And, and, and I can validate what you said. Cause like I said, I've been in, I've been in ministry for over 28 years. Um, like Jim Weidman always says, you know, doing kid ministry before kid ministry was cool. Yeah. Um, you know, I started with the flannel graph board and, and, uh, you nice. know, a little corner basement room. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I was just a kid when I was doing it, you know, which was crazy, but you're right. Um, and, and, and when I first got my first children's pastor's job, um, a lot of it was about me being the storyteller and the puppet guy and doing magic tricks and, and, and being that, and, and now I'm more of a leader of leaders. Um, sure. and, and that's, yeah, so that's, that's cool. Um, I'm glad you're seeing that trend. Um, that, that does excite me too. Well, before we wrap up, um, tell a little, I want the listeners to hear, you've got a variety of, of consulting and church growth things um, that you're doing, um, you know, besides, you know, you're, you are a full-time pastor, but you've got a heart for the kingdom and helping churches understand how to be more strategic because that is a big weakness, especially, and well, I'll probably get in trouble for saying this, but for smaller churches. Um, and I say that cause I was guilty cause I've been in smaller churches, but larger churches can be just as guilty. Um, if, if the leader's not super strong, drifting all over the place. Um, you know, I've seen pastors get caught up in, well, whatever the, the hottest podcast is, that's the strategy I'm going to use this month. And then, oh, I heard this on another podcast, so let's go do this. Yeah. And that, that creates chaos and distress and conflict and all sorts of things. You've got a ministry that has, from what I've understood it to be, is, is really can help take all these different ideas and bring it down and help a church learn who they are and where they should go. Um, tell people about it because they may want to do some investigation and, and check out your ministry. Sure. You make it sound way better than it really is though, just so you know. Now one, <laughs> one aspect is awesome. That's because it had nothing to do with me and I didn't create it. Um, it's a thing called Stratop. Um, and there's church Stratop. It's just a blend of the word strategic and operations. Most churches like you're talking about live in the operating world. We're getting by week to week. We're managing today. Um, and then Stratop really helps you focus on the strategic world, planning for tomorrow, today. So that was something that was created uh, a long time ago by a guy named Tom Patterson. He used that in the business world as a Christian man. He's in his 90s now today. And as he was retiring, wanted to like take what he had learned from the business world and apply it, help, help churches, because he saw that, that that piece was missing there as well. So it's really just a process where you, as a church or a, really any organization could do it, you get facilitated and walk through different exercises as a team. I do it, the way I do it is a two day thing to start with. And we go through a lot. It's a long two days, but you talk about everything you can imagine. It's really helpful as you get perspective on your past and where you, where you are currently and then plan for the future. And then you come back um, two months later, usually have another one day on site where you kind of finalize your plans. Okay, here are the things we're going after. Here are the big four things we're going after. And here are the plans that we've put in place to attack them. And then you just, you start executing that plan. And so Stratup's designed to be really a, something you can kind of adopt and make it your strategic planning process every year. Um, you can, you do it once and you get walked through it by a facilitator uh, like myself, but there's, you know, there are hundreds of facilitators. And what I love about it is it's not consulting, you know, because I don't feel like you should hire me because I don't have anything to offer to your church, but Stratop does. It's great. And my experience is limited. Hopefully there's something I could add to it. But the way I'll tell people is it's 95% the process and your input, your ideas, your reflection, all that kind of stuff. 5% me throwing something in there, asking a certain question. So I got um, trained and certified in that. And another reason I did is I love strategy. So, I mean, it was always appealing to me. But you know this, too. As a family pastor, as a children's pastor, as a student pastor, oftentimes if I were helping a, a, another church, say it was a children's pastor or a student pastor, we start talking. And right away, you can tell this is not a student ministry challenge. This is not a children's ministry challenge. This is a church-wide challenge, and you can't really fix it 
by yourself as, as the children's person or student person. So that's what excited me about StratUp was if there was a church that one needed help with, with the overall direction of their church, StratUp could do that. And maybe they could take that to their leadership and say, hey, I think this would be helpful for us and walk through it and feel really good about coming out on the other side with a unified plan. We're all on the same page, you know, that kind of thing. So it's exciting. I've, I, actually, our church just went through it for the first time, our leadership team. Uh, we just did round one, and we're kind of getting our plans together, and we're going to meet for round two in a couple months, and so I'm excited about that. Cool, cool. So if somebody wants to connect up with you, how would they get in touch with you? Um, the best is probably just going to my blog, uh, nickblevins.com. That's also my Twitter handle and Facebook. Uh, some student got that on Instagram, so that's not me. I'm N.A. Blevins there. Uh, actually, there's a funny story about that. We were at an Orange Tour one time, and we had taken some volunteers and one of our volunteers was using Instagram and I don't know if it still works like this, but he um, tagged another guy from our church and me, he thought he tagged me. He put Nick Blevins. Well, that wasn't me on Instagram. Again, it was like a 15 year old high school student. And, <laughs> and, but Twitter, I guess somehow would like figure out cause he had it connected to Twitter. So then it showed up on Twitter and it said, here at the Orange Tour with so and so, so and so, and Swag Blevins. Like that was that student's Twitter handle. <laughs> I'm like, that is not me. Yeah. Never have that Twitter handle or that handle anywhere. Darn. You need to buy it from him or something. Yeah, I don't want any part of Swag. swag <laughs> but I'm good. I'm good. But anyway, yeah, you can you can connect with me there. You can see the 30 apps resource. Uh, read more about StratOp, all that kind of stuff. And I'd love to hear from anybody that goes there. What apps are you using? What yeah. uh, what's working well? What challenges are you facing? Because I, you know, we all need to learn. Uh, me yeah. especially. Yeah. Well, I'll encourage our listeners to to go check that out. And yeah, post your post your favorite apps over there. We'll start another one uh, on the Facebook group as well uh, once this podcast goes live as well. So, all right. Well, um, hey Nick, thanks again for your time, sharing your heart, your wisdom. Um, it's awesome, always awesome to connect up with uh, another leader um, who's who's doing some good stuff. So um, thanks again for listening to the KMC podcast. Um, we're looking forward to bringing more back to you as, as we uh, get more guests on and more, more programs are coming up soon. Um, look for us on iTunes. And if you do that, please uh, leave a review or if you'd like to subscribe. Um, the more people that do that, the better uh, our ranking becomes and more people can get exposed. And that's our goal, uh, our Kid Ministry Collective team. Um, we've selected the verse Proverbs 27, 17, uh, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. And that's our goal uh, about this podcast is just to sharpen our community, to help each other out. So uh, God bless you. Keep up the, the work for the kingdom and uh, we'll uh, catch you on the next episode of the KMC.